Okay, we've all seen these kind of sad images, right? These kind of, well, polar bear here, drifting away in a warming ocean, well, slowly going to his death, most probably. And you also know these images of birds covered in oil, dying on the shoreline. Forests being felled. Deserts covering once fertile fields. And these giant forest fires, destroying everything on their path. Sadly, we're all too familiar with these kind of images. And if you don't want to look at these images, you can look at graphs in all sizes and shapes, and they will tell you the same thing. Nature is suffering. Biodiversity, the diversity of plant, animal, and microbial life on Earth, is in a dire state. And these messages of doom are actually coming to us from various sources, from the people who know, the United Nations, governments, NGOs, all kinds of scientists. And the underlying assumption is always like, okay, this will trigger us into action, right? Because this is so terrible. I need to do something. We need to do something all together. This can't go on. No time to waste, right? We all remember the old Greenpeace campaign. And depending on the mood and the campaign of the day, it can mean saving the whales, saving the tigers, the Arctic, the Amazon, whatever. So, yes, maybe, but maybe it's not how it works. Maybe these messages of doom and this bad news show doesn't trigger us into action. Maybe it leads to paralysis and to fear. Maybe instead of saying, what can I do? I say, I can't do anything anymore. All is lost. I become paralyzed. I don't know what to do anymore. So maybe what we need, instead of having this bad news all the time, is success stories. Maybe we need nature conservation success stories. And yes, these exist. There are some out there. So that sounds great. And that's why I wanted to focus today on these success stories. But then what is a success story? Because that's the main problem. When you say we're going to speak about success, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to me? What does that mean to the plants and animals we're talking about? So take this one here, the wolf. So the wolf came back to the Netherlands and Belgium and to other places in Western Europe spontaneously. And, well, that's great news, right? That's a great conservation success. I can say so because I don't own any sheep. But then think of other species, like less threatening species, not like this wolf. But think of the beaver, very cuddly animal, wouldn't harm anyone. Seems nice, right? Just came back to many countries. It's not a danger to anyone, I think. But then beavers build dams. And these dams sometimes flood people's lands. Of course, I don't own any land except my own house in the city. So, yeah, I don't care. Beavers are a great conservation success story to me, but not to everyone else, of course. And then think of using heavy machinery in nature areas, for example, to restore habitats or to keep the last rare flower, the mountain pansy, the zinc fieldje, alive here in Limburg. Is that a conservation success story or not? And think of the Oostvaardersplasse. I'm sure you're familiar with that area here in the Netherlands. Is that a conservation success story or not? So the thing is, when we talk about success in conservation, we need to reflect on how we can define that. And two things are really important there. First of all, success is in the eye of the beholder. What you deem a success may not be what I deem a success in nature conservation. And recognizing that means that we actually need to define success in a plural way. We need to define success in an inclusive way so that everyone actually feels that a certain initiative of nature conservation was a success. And to do that means we need to talk about values. What do people actually value when they look at nature? Do they think nature has intrinsic value, meaning a right of existence? in and of itself, regardless of humans? Or does nature have a value because it provides benefits to humans, right? We all depend on nature somehow for food, for uh, well, clean air, clean water, for carbon storage, for example. So maybe that's how we should value nature, in an instrumental way. And maybe some other people, they value nature in a more relational way, both individually and collectively. What counts, maybe, is what kind of relation we have to nature. 
And that can be individual indeed, like maybe you want to go jogging into the forest, but it's also a cultural thing. Think of all our old European stories set in forests, like Snow White, for example. But also think of Mount Everest, which is a sacred mountain for the Nepalese, for example. So yes, defining nature in a plural way is probably what we need to do in order to define success. But then it's also about trade-offs. Who will decide about that? I'll take a recent example. In Belgium a few weeks ago, a swimming contest in open water was cancelled because two little bitterns, and these are birds, which you probably don't know, were nesting in a stretch of reed along that river. Is that acceptable or not? Or is that ridiculous to cancel that swimming contest for that? Or think of halting a construction site because swallows are nesting there. And in the construction site was halted for months. They had to wait until the end of the breeding season of these swallows. It costs hundreds of thousands of euros. Is that successful or not? Is this good conservation? Or think of nature compensation areas in harbors. So you create new nature to make space for development elsewhere. Is that a good idea or not? Well, it's hard to tell. It depends whom you're talking to. It depends on context too. So maybe what we need to do when we talk about success in terms of nature conservation is to switch glasses, switch lenses, trying to imagine we're someone else, looking at nature through the eyes of the other. And in doing so, this may actually lead to more empathy. We may sympathize more with people's views on nature. We may understand why they look at nature in different ways. It may also make all these nature conservation challenges much more concrete, much more tangible. Because then you'll start imagining how other people look at that. Think, for example, of the scale of nature conservation and nature protection. Should that happen on a large scale, like globally, or even here in the Netherlands? Should we have these large natural areas without human interference? Or should we focus on small is beautiful? I'm sure many of us have these kind of insect hotels in our gardens. So again, it's important to talk to people and to realize that often there is no blueprint approach, that there's different ways to value nature and to look at nature. So now let's look at two very concrete nature areas. And let's do that. Let's switch glasses and switch lenses and try to understand how other people see nature. So first we'll go to the beach, a regular beach, like the ones we have here in the Netherlands and in Belgium. I know it's far from Limburg, but not that far after all. So maybe imagine now you're a kid, you're looking at that beach. A beach is a natural area somehow, or could be. But when you're a kid, a beach is just the place where you want to, well, revel in the magic of sea and sand. You want to play. That's what you want the beach to be like. Or maybe you're a surfer, and then maybe you prefer empty beaches with beautiful waves, waves which you can crest in lonely intensity. Or maybe you're a music lover. And then the beach is the place where you go to festivals. Or you're a fisherman and you're looking for a tasty meal on the beach or next to the beach. Or say you're a birder and for you the beach should be a pristine natural area where you try to find a rare nesting ringed plover, for example. So all these different views, all these different perspectives on the beach actually coexist. So that's what happens when you switch glasses. You realize that others look at that same stretch of land that same piece of nature in very different ways. Let's now go a little bit further. We're again very close to the coast, as you can see. We're in Kenya now, along the shores of the Indian Ocean. So it's much warmer, it's still a beach, but over there in the tropics, often there's mangroves on the beach. And mangroves are these kind of bizarre trees with these stilt roots. And these trees, they thrive in salt water, in seawater. They need that to survive, basically. So now again, imagine you are all these different people looking at these mangrove forests. Maybe you're a Kenyan fisherman and you look at this mangrove and you think, oh, that's great. Because you know that the fish like to lay their eggs among the stilt roots. So for you as a Kenyan fisherman, you know that this mangrove is a fish nursery. So you want to protect that mangrove. You want it to stay there. But now think you're the minister in the Kenyan government. And Kenya is still a poor country. And what you want to do is to develop your country. 
So you want harbors to be built, you want hotels to be built on that coast. And of course you want to clear the mangroves. They're muddy and smelly after all, so you don't need them. But then you have a colleague, he's also a minister in the Kenyan government, and he's like, oh no, we should keep the mangroves, because it's protecting our shoreline against tsunamis, against storms, and against, well, rising sea levels, so we should keep it there. So again, you switch glasses, but you don't have a solution yet, because everyone has this other view. Or say you're a tourist, and maybe you want to go with your kayak along the mangrove-lined creeks and get that jungle feeling. Then you want the mangroves to stay. Or you're another kind of tourist, and what you want on the beach is just to bake in the sand. Well, that's great, but then the mangrove has to go. So we've seen that switching glasses is a good first step, but it's not sufficient to make sure that you will actually get to a conservation success story. So, in order to show you how that can happen, we'll look at two examples in a little bit more detail now. So we were in Kenya, now we're crossing the Indian Ocean, we're going full east, and we arrive in Malaysia. And along the west coast of Malaysia, lining the shores of the Straits of Malacca, you find Matang mangrove forest. It's paradise, as you can see. You arrive there, giant trees, uh, wide rivers lined by these trees, Lots of butterflies, monkeys, and birds. There's a nice little fishing harbor. Uh, there's some tourists, but not a lot. So you, you're really happy. You're in paradise. It's a jungle. But you're also in the middle of a production forest. Because in Matang mangrove forest, trees are regularly being cut down. I mean, there's timber being produ produced. There's actually factories making charcoal within that forest. And this charcoal is then exported to Japan, for example. So it's an economic hub. It's a powerhouse, this mangrove. Doesn't look like, maybe, but it is. And it's also an important place for fishermen. So this is the fishing harbor of Kuala Sepetang, there uh, in Matang. Next to that, as I said, it's also key for tourists. Tourists go there, they hop on a boat, and they go to watch dolphins and fireflies, then they go to a nice restaurant. So this is all combined in this same area. But how come that it works? Because it does work. Matang mangrove has been called the best managed mangrove forest in the world by many scientists. And, well, yes, they have a point, because it all kind of works out. And that's because for over a century now, every five years, the forestry department and all the other people involved, they make these kind of management plans. I know it sounds very boring, but these management plans are actually what is needed to reconcile the wishes and expectations of all these people involved in the management of Matang. The fishermen, the charcoal uh, factory owners, uh, the tourists, the hotel owners, the forestry department itself, and they all come together when they draft that management plan. Okay, that sounds great. We have found our conservation success story here. But Maybe we don't need to go that far, because Malaysia, yeah, it's quite far from here, of course, and maybe there it works. But here in the Low Countries, in the Netherlands and Belgium, it can also work. We tend to be very critical when we look at natural areas in our own backyard, so to say, because we know the situation better, and we often have that personal link with the area. But think of the Wadden Sea, for instance. The Wadden Sea is an internationally important bird area. And yes, that's a formal, official term used in policy documents. It's the home of thousands of eider ducks, the one you're seeing there, oyster catchers, gulls and terns. It's also home to thousands of seals. And its importance for European biodiversity is undisputed. It's a key area. But next to that, the Wadden Sea is also a very coveted piece of sea and islands in one of the most densely populated places in northwestern Europe. In one of the richest places also of northwestern Europe. And so there's also lots of economic interest over there. Of course, there's fisheries, cockles, mussels, fish, but also natural gas, which is especially topical in these heated geopolitical times. But next to that, the Wadden Sea is also a tourist's paradise. Beachgoers, water sporters, performance artists flocking to the Udol festival, for example, every summer. 
I mean, these people also want to use the water sea. And out of this patchwork of expectations and preferences and perspectives on the water sea, well, a kind of success story emerges. Oh, it's not perfect. There are conflicts. There are disagreements. But there are also laws, regulations, conflict resolution mechanisms, uh, negotiations, and hundreds of people and organizations discussing the fate of the water sea every day. And yes, it's sometimes a very messy process, all this governance of the water sea. But it does lead to a conservation success story, what is different perspectives can actually coexist. So yes, we can argue about the degree of success, the kind of success we're seeing in these two examples we discussed today. But what have we learned so far? Well, one thing is that conservation doesn't need to be perfect. Nature conservation is about making things possible and feasible. It's not about perfection. And maybe we don't need drama to care for nature. Maybe what we need is looking at the world through the eyes of another. And in doing so, nature may actually benefit from it. And I hope that I've shown that today very briefly in these success stories. And yes, now I dare to use the word success story. Thank you very much. <laughs>